This is Space Time Series 20, Episode 37. Coming up on Space Time. The brown dwarf reclassified as a planet. A link established between ancient impact events and long-lived volcanic eruptions on Earth. And why do so many people still think the moon landings were a hoax? All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. An object originally thought to be one of the nearest brown dwarfs to Earth has now been reclassified as a planet. The study reported in the Astrophysical Journal Letters demonstrates the fine line which separates brown dwarfs from the smaller stars and the largest planets. Brown dwarfs are substellar objects. At one end, they're at least 13 times the mass of Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system. At the other, they're both cooler and less massive than the smallest main sequence stars, the spectral type M red dwarf stars, which usually have surface temperatures above 2400 Kelvin and are greater than 0.08 times the mass of the Sun. A main sequence star is one that's undergoing nuclear hydrogen fusion in its core, the process which makes stars like the Sun shine. Unlike stars in the main sequence, brown dwarfs aren't massive enough to sustain nuclear fusion of hydrogen into helium in their core. However, some brown dwarfs are sufficiently massive to undergo some limited deuterium and lithium fusion early in their lives. Like stars, brown dwarfs are given spectral classification designations, and the most massive can be included in the spectral type M category, which also includes the least massive stars. Progressively less massive brown dwarfs are classified as spectral type L, T and Y, depending on their mass, luminosity and surface temperature. As brown dwarfs slowly cool and contract over time, the most massive ones will drop off the spectral type M classification and fall down to the spectral type L category. The contraction usually ends after the first few hundred million years, although the cooling will be continuous. What all this means is that the temperatures of brown dwarfs can range from as hot as stars to as cool as planets depending on how old they are. For example, right now Jupiter, which is not a brown dwarf but a planet, actually generates more heat than what it gets from the Sun. Now a team studying a brown dwarf known as SIMP J013656.5 plus 093347, there its right ascension and declination coordinates in the sky, or SIMP0136 for short, have determined that it's actually not a brown dwarf, but rather a planet. SIMP0136 is part of a 200 million year old group of stars known as the Carina Nia. They're located about 21 light years away in the constellation Pisces the Fish. Carina Nair is a small group of stars, brown dwarfs and free-floating planets all moving together through space. It's considered a prime region to search for free-floating planetary-like objects because they provide a good way of age-dating these cold, isolated worlds. Knowing the age as well as the temperature of free-floating objects like these is necessary to determine their mass. The authors were able to determine that SIMP0136 is about 13 times the mass of Jupiter placing it at the very boundary which separates brown dwarfs from planets. The study's lead author, Jonathan Garnet from Carnegie University, says free-floating planetary mass objects are valuable because they're very similar to gas giant planets which orbit around stars, like our own solar systems, Jupiter or Saturn. However, unlike exoplanets orbiting other stars, the atmospheres of free-floating planets are comparatively much easier to study. The problem is, observing the atmospheres of exoplanets found within distant star systems is really challenging. That's because the extremely dim light being emitted by these orbiting exoplanets is hugely overwhelmed by the brightness of their host stars. The light from those stars literally blinds the instruments the astronomers are using to try and characterise an exoplanet's atmosphere. Gunnay says the implication that SIMP0136 is actually more planet-like than previously thought will help scientists to better understand the atmospheres of giant planets and how they evolve. They may be easier to study in great detail, but the problem is these free-floating worlds are still extremely hard to discover in the first place. That's because, well, firstly, they can be located almost anywhere in the sky, and secondly, they're really hard to tell apart from brown dwarfs or very small stars. It's for this reason that researchers have only been able to confirm a very small handful of free-floating planetary-like objects so far. This newest addition to the very select club of free-floating planets is especially remarkable because the authors had already detected fast-evolving weather patterns on the surface of SIMP-0136, back when they still thought it was a brown dwarf. 
and in a field where analysing exoplanetary atmospheres is of the utmost interest, having already seen evidence of weather patterns on an easier-to-observe free-floating planet that exists away from the brightness of a host star is an exciting discovery. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and junk on the web I find interesting, important, or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter. And on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com forward slash spacetime with Stuart Gary. Major asteroid, comet and meteorite impacts on Earth have now been linked to significant long-term volcanic eruptions. The findings reported in the Journal of Geophysical Research Planets shows that cosmic impact events can trigger intense, long-lived and explosive volcanic eruptions, which can change a planet's surface and climate by bringing up material from deep below. The authors reached their conclusions by examining rocks filling one of the largest preserved impact structures on the planet, the Sudbury Impact Basin in Ontario, Canada. The asteroid, which hit the Earth at Sudbury some 1.85 billion years ago, excavated a deep basin which was filled with melted target rocks and then later with jumbled mixed rocks full of tiny volcanic fragments. Not only were there volcanic fragments throughout the sequence of the 1.5 kilometre thick basin, but they have very distinctive angular shapes. These shapes form when bubbles expand in molten rock and then catastrophically explode, a feature of violent eruptions involving water. In fact, exactly these sort of features are usually seen under the glaciers of Iceland. At Sudbury, these took place for a long period of time after the impact, when the basin was flooded with seawater. The authors found that the composition of the volcanic fragments changed over time. Right after the impact, the volcanism is directly related to the melting of the Earth's crust as a result of the impact event. However, over time, the volcanism seems to have been fed more and more by magma coming up from deeper levels within the Earth. One of the study's authors, Blaz Camber from Trinity College Dublin, says it's an important finding because it means that the magma sourcing the volcanoes was changing with time. He says the effects of large impacts on early Earth could therefore be far more serious than previously thought. On the early Earth, there was a relatively brief period during which some 150 very large impacts occurred, whereas since then only a handful have hit the planet. This intense bombardment on the early Earth must have had destructive effects on the planet's surface, and it may also have brought up lots of material from deep within the planet's interior, which then shaped the overall structure of the planet. The new findings will also have ramifications for similar research on volcanism and other planetary bodies, such as Mercury, Venus, Mars and the Moon. There, unlike the Earth, the lack of plate tectonics and erosion helps preserve surface features, and these can then be probed by spacecraft. The insight from Sudbury is complemental because scientists can directly observe the rocks with their own eyes and collect as many samples as they need for detailed study in the lab. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And now we take a break from the show to talk about our new sponsor, Marley Spoon. One of the guys who helps me put space time together, Hugh, has been testing out Marley Spoon, and he wants me to try it as well. What they do is they make all these delicious menus up for you, deliver it to your front door, bingo, done, simple, no going to the supermarket. Okay, but I can burn water. I mean, I can't cook. No, you would cook with this, trust me. I can't cook either, and I was turning out gourmet dishes. My kids never, ever compliment us on our food, but they were actually asking questions about where we got it from and how come I learned to cook so quickly. And even my wife, who'd been a bit sceptical when I first said we were getting this, suddenly was going, can we subscribe full time and take this on? And I'll tell you one of the things that really works, Stuart, was that it gave us options of food that we wouldn't normally eat in our family. So it sort of broadened our horizons, if you like. You've put me onto this because I'm a takeout person. That's all I eat, takeaway food. And you reckon even I can cook this? I reckon even you, Stuart, should give it a go because I think you would surprise yourself. The only other thing that's really good about these recipes, being so simple... They all only take about 30 minutes to do. 30 to 40 minutes was tops. And that's when you're sitting there looking at the recipe cards going, step one, step two, step three. Oh, I need to check what step one was. But the recipe cards are so clearly laid out that you can't fail. You cannot go wrong. So you became an instant gourmet. What did you cook? They offer a real variety of foods on their menu. Now, I've got this week's menu open, for instance. Listen to this, Stuart. Your takeaway food's gone. You could be eating tonight crispy skin chicken with almond potatoes. We've got Japanese tofu and vegetables, perfect for the vegetarian. Beef enchilada bake. 
cake with corn and beans. That, by the way, is a kid-friendly recipe. We've got chicken and vegetable noodle soup, chicken cacciatore with couscous. It just goes on and on. There's 16 dishes there on the menu every week, and they change every week. Now, Stuart, we've got a really special offer for our Space Time fans. If you're living in Australia, head over to marleyspoon.com.au, and when you sign up and use the code SPACE on the checkout, you'll get $35 off your very first order. And for our North American listeners in the USA, if you go to marleyspoon.com, you can use space at the checkout as well and get $30 off your first order as well. So Marley Spoon, changing the way you cook. And now back to our show. In July 1969, humans landed and walked on the surface of the moon for the first time. The historic images were beamed directly to the park's radio telescope, and from there to the United States and the rest of the world. In all, 12 Americans have walked on the surface of the moon, beating the Soviet Union to the ultimate high ground, the primary propaganda objective of this flank of the Cold War. Orbital images of the lunar descent modules at their landing sites, the sacks of lunar rocks brought back from the moon for scientific studies still happening today, and lunar laser reflectors left on the surface by the astronauts are all proof of mankind's first expeditions to another world. Yet, for some reason, there are still conspiracy theorists out there who insist the Apollo moon landings never happened and were simply filmed on a Hollywood backlot somewhere. Each and every one of these conspiracy theorists have reached their conclusions without any real understanding of the science and consequently with no real understanding of what they're actually seeing and therefore basing their opinions on. Time and time again, when they're presented with hard, incontrovertible evidence to destroy one of their claims, rather than accepting that one of the primary foundation stones of their beliefs has just been blown out of the water, they'll ignore that inconvenient truth and simply come up with the next claim on their list. It's a tried and tested method, first used in the 1960s by the tobacco industry to challenge the medical science that smoking causes cancer. The motto being, you don't have to prove it doesn't cause cancer, you just have to plant some doubt in the community. And of course, more recently, we've seen exactly the same tactics employed by the fossil fuel industry to challenge the science of climate change being caused by increases in atmospheric carbon dioxide levels as a direct result of human activity, such as burning coal and oil. If you recall, originally the climate change deniers' argument was that there was no evidence to support the idea of climate change. After all, yesterday was cold and there's snow predicted tomorrow. Then, as average global temperatures kept increasing, they were forced to change their mantra to, well, maybe climate change is happening, but it's all part of the natural cycle of climatic patterns, and it's not being caused by human activity through the burning of coal and oil to produce carbon dioxide. Once the charts showing the direct correlation between increases in carbon dioxide emissions and increases in global temperatures became impossible to refute, the climate change deniers moved to their current line of defence. Oh well, maybe climate change is real after all, and maybe anthropologic carbon dioxide emissions are to blame, but there's absolutely nothing we can do about it. And anyway, it's all too late. By the way, climate change deniers love the term anthropologic carbon dioxide emissions. That's because it doesn't sound like what it really means, that people's increased use of fossil fuels is to blame. When it comes to conspiracy theories about the moon landings, there are countless claims, and you need an entire show to cover them all. But let's just rehash a few of the big ones. The most popular is the claim that the Stars and Stripes is seen waving in the non-existent lunar wind. Now, there's no air on the moon, so that means it must have been filmed on Earth and a breeze caused the flag to flutter. The truth is the flutter was created as the astronauts worked to erect the flag and as a stiffening wire was adjusted, the flag appeared to wave. Another one of my favourites is the question of why are there are no stars in the lunar sky? Well, the simple answer is that during the lunar daytime, light from the sun, as well as sunlight reflecting off the ground, washed out all the stars in the lunar sky, just as it does during daytime on Earth. Another great classic concerns the different shadow and lighting angles in lunar surface photographs, which apparently is clear evidence of studio lighting. The simple truth is, shadows on the moon are complicated by reflected light, uneven ground contours, wide-angle lens distortions, the low angle of the sun, and lunar dust. The multiple light sources include the sun, earth light, that is sunlight reflected from the earth, sunlight reflected from the moon's surface, and sunlight reflected from the astronauts and the lunar module. Light from these sources is being scattered by lunar dust in multiple directions, including into shadows. Shadows falling into craters and hills can also appear longer, shorter and distorted. 
And by the way, the reason the film used for the lunar surface images didn't melt in the 140 degree temperatures on the moon is that it was kept in protective canisters and not left out in the sunlight. There are also heaps of questions about problems with the crosshairs in many lunar surface photos. Some show crosshairs rotated or in the wrong place, while others show them behind foreground objects, clear evidence of things being added later. It turns out all the problems involving crosshairs are in reproduced or cropped images, and not in the originals. Then there are claims that some photos contain artefacts, like the two seemingly matching seas on a lunar rock on the ground, which are allegedly clear evidence of labels on studio props. But again, the so-called sea is not on the original image. In fact, it's been attributed to a curled-up hair that appeared during photo reproduction. Claims that you would need moisture in the soil to leave footprints behind and the moon has no water also fails the test because the dust which makes up the top layer of the lunar soil is as fine as talcum powder. So it's easy to leave tracks and prints behind because there's no wind to blow them away and they're held in place by the friction between these fine grains. Then there was the question of where was the crater caused by the lunar module's rocket motor during landing. Well, that fine dust we talked about was kicked up as other photos from the lunar surface show. But the subsurface soil beneath this fine dust is mostly densely packed rock, dense enough to prevent a crater from forming as a result of the LEMS rocket motors. Another common claim is that travelling through the Van Allen radiation belts to reach the moon should have been enough to kill the astronauts anyway. However, the truth is, unless you hover in the radiation belts for a significant period of time, that is hours or days, the radiation exposure wouldn't be enough to pose any long-term threat to life. Then there's the question, after making it through the radiation belts, why weren't the crew and spacecraft pummeled by all the micrometeoroids floating around through space? Well, the truth is, while there are a lot of micrometeoroids, their density per cubic metre of space is extremely low, so the odds were always pretty good in the astronauts' favour of not getting hit. And just in case they were hit, both the spacecraft and the astronauts' spacesuits were all heavily shielded with things like Kevlar. So... The science to answer outstanding questions is there, and it's easy to find, just so long as you stick with reputable sources. Remember the need for peer review where appropriate, and avoid websites by know-it-alls who have got an angle to push, or got their doctorates from bogus universities or out the back of cereal boxes. But why are some people so willing to believe in conspiracy theories in the first place? Aran Sager is the president of Australian Skeptics. This is not a skepticism question. This is a psychology question, obviously. The thing is, almost anything that happens in the world that seems a little bit um, out of the ordinary or, or challenges people's views of the way things should be immediately uh, has a some kind of conspiracy theory attached to it. This could be things like the Kennedy assassination. People obviously didn't expect that to happen. It challenged a lot of people's view of the world, uh, all the way down to Sandy Hook, the... Uh, the massacre of school children in Connecticut a few years ago. People prefer the world to be more structured, more orderly. They prefer it to follow the rules that they feel comfortable with. And some people just feel uncomfortable with the situation. And some people go one step further and challenge the, the truth of something that happened. We see it around almost anything that's out of the ordinary. It is not unique to the moon uh, landing and... Uh, and I really, I can't explain it personally, because for me, it seems quite obvious uh, that we did land on the moon. It seems quite obvious that um, really there was one guy who killed um, JFK. And it seems to me quite reasonable that Al-Qaeda crashed four planes in America in um, 2001. However, for some people, that's too much of a challenge. With the Al-Qaeda thing, there are obviously anti-Semites out there who desperately want to believe that it was something else other than Al-Qaeda doing that. With the moon landing, but there can't be some sort of a, um, a racist reason behind that. There's got to be, my gut feeling is it's really just people trying to make money out of books and docos and things like that any way they can. And unfortunately, according to the polls, between 6 and 20% of Americans, 28% of Russians believe the moon landings were faked, which is it just beggars belief. The evidence is really quite outstanding that it occurred. Heard. I mean, what, 400,000 people would have needed to have been in on the hoax? There, well, there is actually a, a very interesting research, fairly recent research about conspiracy theories that shows using game theory and psychology, the uh, researchers have been able to show that past about 50 people, a conspiracy won't hold. So here we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people who were involved in the moon landing program, in the space program in the 60s and the 70s. The chance that this could be kept a secret, something like this, is basically zero. Again, it's, a, it's very difficult to explain the psychology of a conspiracy theorist, especially since one of the things about conspiracy theories is that they're completely immune to evidence. 
you cannot prove to conspiracy theorists that the theory is wrong, because by that you will only be proving that you are part of the conspiracy. Yeah, you're playing into their narrative. Absolutely. So that's, that's the whole point. By the way, something that's important to note is that there are conspiracies. Okay, so oh, when, yeah. we say cons- when we say conspiracy theory and we, we deride it as something that's a little bit um, unhinged, we're not talking about the idea that there are conspiracies. Of course there are conspiracies. What we're talking about is what we sometimes call grand conspiracies. It's those huge things that would have required collaboration by a multitude of people across multiple points in time and just very large effort of coordination. Those conspiracies are extremely unlikely, and indeed, when you look into the details of these conspiracy theories, you find that they're really anomaly hunting. The idea of most conspiracy theorists, when they look at something like the moon landing, they don't have a comprehensive view of what would have happened that made it look like we landed on the moon. What they say is there is a problem with the crosshairs on the on the camera on, the, on some of the photos. There is a problem with the, the with flag. the shadow with the flag. The flag seems to be moving. There is a problem with the shadows. They don't look to be parallel. They they look at all of these kind of things and they. They say, oh, but this doesn't figure out. But then it's not a comprehensive view. It's just they're looking for things that don't fit in. And the reality is that to each of these things, we have a very good explanation. Uh, so, it's called physics in most cases, and it, and it perfectly it, makes sense if you understand absolutely. the behind it. Absolutely. It's yeah, like, so, so, you know, why are there any stars in the sky if it's really the moon, you know? And yeah. It was daytime. It was daytime, exactly. You know, the exposure was, you know, it was set to a very low exposure. Um, so we have an explanation to each of these anomalies that, there is really not one thing that these people raise that cannot be counted very, very easily. But what would normally happen is that they would jump to the next question. So you can spend a lot of time simply responding to another one and another one and another one and another one. However, in the end, they're not really interested in the evidence. It's a conspiracy theory. It's a theory. It's immune to evidence. What they're trying to be is in control. They're trying to show that they know to themselves, not necessarily to the world, that they know something that the rest of the world doesn't know. And it makes them feel comfortable. The idea that people want to make money out of it there's a small number of people who do, but most of the conspiracy theorists around any such conspiracy are just doing it for their own uh, mental well-being. You're the president of Australian Skeptics. Tell me about the organization. What does it do? We try to promote skepticism and critical thinking. Skepticism is at the basis of science. It is the idea that you do not accept information, views, opinions, simply because somebody said so, because it feels comfortable, or because that's what you want to be the case. You form your opinions, you form your views based on the evidence. And if the evidence changes or uh, the evidence that you're aware of changes and you need to change your opinion, that is a exactly what you do. So our slogan is seek the evidence, and that is what we try to do. As an organization, we are I would say that we are a, uh, a lobbying organization. What we try to do is we try to make the public uh, behave in a more rational way, and we try to also ensure that governments at various levels create policies that are based on the evidence. We try to promote the right kind of thinking in the press because the press is very often guilty of promoting unskeptical and critical views simply because it sells sells papers, sells ads. And we try to promote a more critical view of the world in the press as well. So we are a lobbying organization in essence. Over the past few years, we've seen a lot of that, not just with things like uh, vaccines and homeopathy, but also on issues such as uh, whether or not climate change is real. Often the media will say, well, we're trying to get both sides of the story. Well, if you really wanted to get both sides of the story, you would then have 99 scientists saying climate change is real for every skeptic saying it's not. Well, uh, this whole idea of both sides of the story, which we call false balance, is a complete travesty. You do not for example, on Holocaust Memorial Day, invite somebody who's been in, at Auschwitz and uh, at the same time call somebody who's a Holocaust denier because you accept that what happened there really happened, what we know happened really happened, and you accept that there's no point just giving uh, you know, giving a platform to somebody who thinks that it didn't. I don't know why in some areas the idea of a balance, that balance is required, takes hold, but we certainly see it around areas that are to do with science. And I think partially it's to do with the fact that science journalism is on the decline for, for a variety of reasons that I'm sure we will not be going into today. But I think part of the problem with that is that journalists who are not well versed in science have to deal with science content. And for them, really, they, they just don't know what's true and what's not true. And therefore, they prefer to simply 
show both sides and, and that creates the impression that there's some equivalence there on both sides. It creates the impression in the US that evolution and creation are equivalent. It creates the impression here as well as in the US that or in many much of the West that climate change is still under some kind of debate within the scientific community, which we know it isn't. And it creates the same kind of uh, debate. That's Iran Sager from Australian Skeptics. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice weekly podcast through iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, your favorite podcast download provider, or direct from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. The show's also broadcast coast to coast across the United States on Science 360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world on TuneIn Radio and as part of Virgin Australia's in-flight entertainment. If you want more space time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and junk on the web I find interesting, important, or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter. And on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com forward slash space time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, Pocket Casts or Audio Boom. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. This edition of Space Time is brought to you by Marley Spoon. Choose your own menu with lots of new recipes every week. And as a special incentive for Australian listeners, if you go to marleyspoon.com.au, you'll get 35 Aussie dollars off your first order when you use the special code SPACE at the checkout. And for American listeners, go to marleyspoon.com and get 30 US dollars off your first order when you use the code SPACE at the checkout. Marley Spoon, changing the way you cook.